And come back to the second lecture by uh, Simon on uh, creation and control of these ultra cold molecules. And, uh, think, and then after this, the lecture by uh, Professor Rempe. And then we'll have dinner up here, not down there. And then whatever else we should be doing, uh, we will decide after dinner. So please go ahead. Yeah. Great. So uh, the last time we met was in the games with the uh, best references and the VM threshold and states and navigation all those beautiful levels. Today, uh, the plan is to, to go to the ground state uh, and then do some experiments with the models in the ground state. So just to remind you, for those that don't, don't work on the assembled molecules like this, so, so we've ticked this off. Uh, step two is to do this uh, optical transfer simulated from head out of passage to do the absolute ground state of the model, removing this six thousand calories, so combining them again. So that's the plan. Explain how that works, how we track the molecules, and then uh, uh, involve them on uh, the left one positions that we've already heard about in various people. So um, so what we're going to do is take all of this uh, rich molecular structure, these thousands and thousands of levels, uh, and say, well, that we have three levels that we really care about. <laughs> That's enough, right? Um, and, and so this is going to be our fetch back level. This is the molecule that we prepared last time in our lectures. Um, and we're going to connect it to the ground state via some excited state over right here. Um, and the key is we don't ever want to populate that level. That makes next slide. Why? Because it's decaying there. If there's any population there, it's gone um, in an uncontrolled way. So the, the trick is to do this theorem. Okay, so we can rewrite, we can write this three level system with these two coupling fields in the rotating wave approximation. We're going to detect this decay. It's never going to go up there anyway, so we just need to worry about it. Uh, and we get this very simple Hamiltonian. Many of you have probably seen this. Um, there's a dark state uh, associated with this, which is a superposition of the states one and three. Okay. And that's important. That's a superposition of our fetch back state that we're starting in and our ground state that we want to get to, uh, and has no contribution from state two. That's why we call it the dark state. <clears throat> And the composition of this dark state is just dependent on the ratio of these of these rapid frequencies. Okay. So uh, steer up is uh, dead simple, right? <laughs> you do this so-called counterintuitive uh, full sequence shown here. So uh, let me talk you through this. So you turn on this this Stokes field, as, as we call it, this blue boson, and that actually initiates the flashback state. As, as the dark state of the system. Okay. And then as you ramp off that Stokes field, you ramp off that, you ramp on this pump field. Um, and as you do that, you hopefully adiabatically evolve the dark state from being purely in state one to being purely in state three. That's shown here. If you solve this, 
for the population in state one and state three is a function of these quarters. Um, that's what happens. The population goes from one to three, which is exactly what we want. We take that population from the weekly bound flashback state all the way down to the absolute ground state of all cases. Okay. So what, what conditions do we need to satisfy to do this? So, so we need to be adiabatic. And that, that's the key thing here. Uh, and so that, that's expressed here. So uh, we need to find transitions with suitable value frequencies given the variable basis uh, and uh, suitable excitement state line width that uh, we satisfy this condition where tau is this kind of overlap time in the two courses. But we don't have complete freedom because on this side, uh, this is how hard we have to work with the latest, right? So this is the essentially the relative laser line, how, how well we have to make these two fields coherence to form this coherent superposition that we then involve. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to use two lasers, and then you don't actually drive any transition. So I wonder where the, where the energy goes to. So, so it's... it's yeah, it, it's stimulated into one of the fields. Stimulated rather than air at the time. So the energy goes out in photons that weren't out in the time. So to, 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 to do this experimentally, um, actually, it's not so hard. Okay. Um, so what we do is we take our two lasers so to address these transitions. And um, we, we buy a nice cavity. <laughs> we leave a commercial available. So, this is a ULE, a, a ultra low expansion glass uh, cavity. Um, and we lock the two lasers to this, this same cavity. Okay. The cavity has a, a line width of about 100 kilohertz. And so, do a reasonable job of locking the lasers to this cavity, you get laser lines on the order of a, a kilohertz or so. Okay. Um, and this is all explained in this paper if you want the, want the details, but we, we use uh, fiber based ELMs because, of course, the cavity modes them as arbitrary frequencies. Uh, and so we, we offset off the lasers using uh, fiber based ELMs. And that basically gives us continuous tunability of the lasers with respect to these cavity modes. Okay, and then, then you start the journey of uh, finding the route. Um, I have to say we benefited enormously um, uh, in parallel work in, uh, in Hans Christoph Nagel's group in, in Innsbruck, who were also doing this spectroscopy at around the same time. Uh, and so, so the first is we have to find this pump transition. Um, so we do a lot of molecular spectroscopy, uh, and actually they identified a suitable transition, and it's this one um, associated with this B triple I, which you'll notice. It sits up here where the, the A and the B states are all kind of mixed. Right? Well, that's also important because what we're doing is going from a flashback state, which is predominantly triplet in character, uh, to uh, the ground state of the molecule, which is singlet in character. So we need to find a state up here that has a nice mixed character uh, to allow us to couple between this uh, triplet and singlet. Uh, and so last time, let me jump on slide ahead, actually. So last time, if you remember, we ended by, I was explaining how we had to get into this minus six state here. So this was the magneto association path we took. I went down here, separated the molecules using this uh, stone girl, and then went back into this minus six state. Uh, and this shows you why. Okay. So this is the lifetime of the fresh plant molecules when they're exposed to this this pump transition, but when they're in either this minus two state, which is the lower one, or this minus six state. And, and the, the lifetime of the minus six state is much, much shorter. And that's because there's much, much stronger coupling from that state than the excitement state. And that's what we want. We want to get a strong, a stronger rally frequency on, on this transition. Okay. And that was part of the reason for explaining how in navigating all these near threshold value states is important because it allows you to change and tailor the character of your molecule for this. Okay. 
In fact, um, if you speak to your favorite theorist, in my case, that's across the road in the chemistry department, Jeremy Hudson, he can calculate the, the wave functions. Um, and, and this is the wave function for this near threshold state, this one state. And then state two uh, looks like this. This is this minus six state that we're using here. And what you notice is that there's a much higher um, probability density at short range. Okay, so, uh, and if you remember, that's because this minus six state is from a higher threshold. Of the atoms, and so it's much more deeply bound okay, comparatively. And, and so, uh, so we get this character, this short range character, which allows us then to couple up to the inside of the state. And then, okay, so we can connect our flashback state up here. We can then shine on this 977 nanometer photon and go down to the ground state. And we do this kind of dark state spectroscopy. So here we're putting the plug pipe on resonance. But the Stokes wasn't doing anything, it just would be the uh, number of flashback molecules. But when the Stokes light, which is stronger, hits, hits a resonance, then we get this dark stained spectrum. Uh, and uh, this is when you crack open the champagne, when you measure two features which are separated uh, by the rotational slipping of the molecule that gives you action there. Okay. So that means we've identified the transitions to the, to the ground state. <clears throat> And you can also then sit on one of these and vary the pumpy tuning and you get your usual dark state if you have the heat back in the future. So then, so then everything is locked and we find the transitions, we're sitting on the transitions, and then you do do stir up. Okay, so in our case, um, we turn off the dipole trap. I'll explain why very shortly. Um, and then we do the, the pulse sequence that I've already described. Okay, we turn on the Stokes, uh, ramp that off as we ramp on the pump. And this transfers us to the ground state. As I explained last time, every single time we detect the molecule, we break it apart and back into the atoms. Okay. So we have to reverse the stirrup sequence to go back to the fresh back molecule, pull the fresh back molecule apart in the atoms. So, we do that every time. So, so that's the standard sequence. <laughs> And then that's what we see. Okay, so here, um, see the flashback molecule number it disappears, measure nothing. Anything to make flashback molecules go away, but uh, you really celebrate when they come back. Okay? And you do this second pulse sequence and get a signal back. This is uh, uh, a bit of this model that I've described. And so this is telling us the ground state population. It's very much. And so in, in our case, this is about 90% efficient. <coughs> uh, and, and we go to the, the vibrational, rotational, and the hyperbine ground state of the model. Um, you have to take that on trust. I'll tell you in the next lecture. Uh, I'll show you this, the, the uh, hyperbine ground state. But for the moment, um, just take that on trust. It's the absolute lowest state of the model. And of course, we uh, reverse this, as I said, to go back to the flashback molecule. Uh, and I just want to stress that that's like a state sensitive detection. Okay, so, if anything that happens to the molecule back there, if it changes its state, then we don't see it. Yeah. Why does the bit become the wobbly on the other part? Here, it, it's, a, it's a numerical solution. That, that, that's all. Um, and and um, there are some. I think in this one, in even the student needs to put in a little bit of noise and decoherence to try and really match the uh, the efficiency that we're seeing. Um, because we have to put something in there to not get any efficiency, and that, that's keeping this in there for Yeah. Why? Yes. Why do we have to turn on the dipole trap? Aha, uh -huh. I'm going to explain that next. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so just to emphasize that so here, what we're doing is producing around 4,000 molecules at uh, about a microtone, but they're dense, uh, and as you'll see, they come on. So, why do we have to turn off the dipole track? Good question. Um, so, <clears throat> this, this illustrates uh, uh, the reason. So, the, this is actually what we published in 2014. This was our stereo um, transfer to the ground state, it wasn't very efficient. I think it was about 50% one way. Um, and this illustrates why. Okay, so this is um, 
driving this pump transition either with the dipole track off, where now we can see very nice rabbi oscillations on the pump transition, or with the dipole track on, um, and we don't see any nice coherent rabbi oscillations. Why is that? Because our dipole track is at 15, 50 nanometers, and our pump transition is at 15, 57 nanometers. So we've got this big, strong dipole track that's putting lots of AC starships across, across the sand. Um, and, and that decoheres the, the uh, pump transition and, and basically limits the coherence that you get. And so when you turn it off, you go from this, this poor transfer to this, this 90%. But it's okay because this time scale is only 100 microseconds or so. So but we really only switch it off for a very short period. <clears throat> and just the same, we can then also measure the uh, Rabbi oscillations on the Stokes transition. So we can do, we can transfer the molecules to the drag state and then pull some of the Stokes lines and then transfer the molecules back. And that way we can measure, measure Rabbi oscillations on the Stokes transition. Uh, and that way we fully characterize the whole, the whole system here. So we have a kind of reduced Rabbi frequency scale by the intensity for both of these transitions. Um, but these are the, some typical numbers that we use in the experiment for these, these Rabbi frequencies. Um, the excited state line width is um, a little bit hard for us to measure, um, but it's of the order of 100 kilohertz or so. No. So, <clears throat> so if you put these into that condition I showed you earlier, we, we easily satisfy the adaptive criteria. Oh, yeah. The excited state line width is quite narrow, and it's not the potential it's going to the, the, the mixed A B part. Um, and I, I think it's probably narrow because we're, we're driving the B part. So we're going to this uh, uh, B triple I um, part, which uh, I, I think that, that's where it's getting into narrow spot. I mean, we've measured numbers of, well, I would say it's around 100 kilohertz to 50 kilohertz. So yeah, it's narrow. So, is, are you still limited by intensity? Or? Um, yes, yeah. Had, well, we've only got to about 10 milliwatts or so in each beam, and then focused at 30 microns. Yeah. And what's the overall One way is 90%, 92%. So, uh, and you think you're limited by power? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, we've just ordered two amplifiers to. Go from 10 milliwatts to one watt. Yeah. They will just have big beams and just fire it in. And then they won't have to worry about the line and certain points. Yeah. 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 Isn't it the two way efficiency between the or the dipole involved and after it pulled off? You think that that's going to be stage coherence, but do you think that that's literally not out of all just flying out of the dipole without putting it back on? Uh, it, it's it's decoherence in the hysteria. I mean, this time scale, this whole time scale here is 100 microseconds. Okay. So the temperatures we're at, nothing moves in 100 microseconds. So it's like a frozen gas. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's uh, limited by the, I think it's actually limited by our pump. Um, you know, this one's a little bit on the low side compared to the stoves, um, but that's, I think, what's limiting. So, so we did this, and then of course, what we want to do is show that we can make a dipole, right? So, uh, so we add an electric field. Um, so, I, I, I did say I started this experiment in 2004, uh, and it was uh, it's been a long road. We certainly didn't think about it from the electrodes in the experiment in 2004. So then kind of these things which are just poked into the uh, um, the experiment from the outside uh, and anybody who's working with electrons will know this is not the idea because uh, because they're sitting outside the cell we're, we're limited in the electric field and can fly before we charge up the cell and then everything goes goes on, stops working um, but luckily the uh, the kind of electric fields you need for rubidium cesium are, are fairly small because it's Big heavy molecule with very small rotation constant. It's very easy to do before it gets molecule with electric field. 
And then we do the spectroscopy in the in the presence of the electric field. So maybe just look at this one. So this is the state that we're using for the Stirac transfer. Um, and it's well separated from some what I think are other high fine components in the excited state, but these all shift with the electric field. And we can measure how the Stokes detuning shifts as well in the electric field. And by that, we can then map out um, the shift of the ground state. So this is really polarizing the molecule in, in the lab. Okay. Um, and these shifts are enormous for the electric field, of course, because the electric field is interacting with this big dipole, big one wire um, inside, the, inside the molecule. But we get megahertz type shifts when you apply electric field. And in this case, we were going up to about, well, almost 24 divide. So the time was a reasonable one, but um, before it came along with several procedures. Yeah. But yeah, so, so there we are. So we've made our ground state policy. Are there any questions on this, this part? We've had some already. Does anybody want to ask before we go? So the first thing you want to do, obviously, is track, track the model. Okay. Um, and uh, what are the options for it? Well, we've already learned that we're dealing with these single signal molecules that do not have an electronic magnetic um, So you can't use a magnetic trap, so you're going to have to turn the light back on the lasers and optically track the molecules. Okay. And as with everything molecular related, it's a little bit more complicated than, than what I showed you last time in terms of tracking atoms. Um, and that's because the, the polarizability of the molecule um, differs whether the, the light is polarized along the intermolecular axis or perpendicular to it. So we have to think of two polarizabilities, what we call alpha parallel and alpha per. Um, and we often find it, what we will find it convenient to actually rewrite this in terms of an isotropic and an anisotropic polarizability. Um, but the two are just straightforward related to these, these alpha parallel atoms. So, this is the isotropic polarizability is good, contributes to trapping. We like it. Okay. This anisotropic polarizability, as you'll see, also next, on the next lecture, it's a bit of a pain. Um, it, it's zero, or I should say almost zero. In n equals zero. Um, but um, in n equals one and n equals two, it, it, it's not zero and it actually then mixes different mn and mf projections of the molecule and plays havoc in the hyper fine structure that I'll show you um, next time. So I think, uh, I forget who, I think it was Nick, who said, uh, to calculate the polarizability of the molecule, we have some over all the transition. Right? And then I showed you last time polarizability of the winning and seeding is fairly easy because I don't need the D2 line, D1, and D2 lines that you really have to consider. Um, so, so if you've not come across this paper, I encourage you to look at it. Um, it's a nice, nice uh, paper from the Libya and Use group. Um, and it does exactly that, right? We do a sum over states formula involving, in principle, the entire energy spectrum of the system. So you do the calculation, they sum over all transitions in, in the molecule. Um, and he does it for all of the bialkali combinations. Okay. Um, and as he points out, knowledge of this polarizability is crucial to model the optical response of molecules when using optical lattice and optical um, and this is just taken from that. And actually, what's nice is they explain how the origin of this alpha parallel and alpha per, um, and that, that's kind of discussed here. Um, let's see what it says. Um, basically, uh, I guess it's summarized down here or in these formulae. So, so alpha parallel is coming over a sum of uh, transitions up to sigma states. Okay. Uh, and that's that's described over here. And alpha parallel, uh, alpha per, sorry, is coming from a sum over transitions to pi states. So this is going to be important also next time that these two 
half a barrel and half a third come from transition in the molecule within the solution. <coughs> uh, and we're going to use that to next time to, to uh, our benefit. But as you can see, that just like the expression I, I showed you last time, uh, it's a sum uh, of uh, some kind of black hole element um, divided by the detuning, um, except that the sum is very big in this case. So this is what it looks like when they do this calculation. All right. So this is the in that paper the rubidium cesium. This is what the polarizability looks like. Um, it's very nice. So every time you see this this horrible mess, that's when you're hitting the transitions uh, and, and the polarizability is just very compulsive. Okay. Okay. But you'll see there are nice regions where uh, you're genuinely off the resonance. And the polarizability is nice and smooth, and there are regions in between where the Frank Hohmann factor suppresses the transitions. Um, but that's what you've got to work. And they also this, this, this is a, just a zoom in um, to this lower lower region. Uh, and what they um, shown here, actually, one of the motivations of this was to to identify what they call magic. So you prepare the flashback molecule in a certain trap, and then you transfer it to the ground state. And ideally, what you want is the trap potential to remain the same. You don't want it suddenly to become very stiff or very weak, because that's when it can keep the sample. So these dashed lines are approximations for the, the flashback uh, polarizability. They're the sum of the atomic polarizabilities, um, which until very recently, I believe, Absolutely true. Uh, this experiment in tweeters that we saw that uh, this is not true. That actually, uh, there are transitions that move the flashback resonance to land because they're, they're changing the color of the flashback states. Um, conveniently, in rubidium season, this is uh, actually close to 1064 nanometers where this, this magic wavelength for the transfer happens. Uh, and we're working down at uh, 1559 that is okay. So we're well detuned for all of these transitions. Um, they also give a very nice um, approximate formula um, for the polarizability, which is summarized here for the isotropic and anisotropic. As you can imagine, you can kind of ignore all of this stuff and, and just parameterize this, this smooth dependence with, with a transition signal uh, with some strain. And, uh, and, and that's what they do in this table. So that, that can be quite useful if you're, if you're wanting to navigate around plan a new measurement. And it's reasonably accurate. So for rubidium season, this shows you the, the difference of this, this simple formula versus the full calculation. Um, and, it's, uh, and this is plus minus 10%. So this is the isotropic component is very good, and the anisotropic component is really good in this uh, low, uh, long wavelength region. So can we measure that? Yes, very easy. So everything I'm going to describe now, it onwards essentially is um, we do the stirrup transfer, but in between we we turn the dipole track on. Okay. And um, we can then vary the amount of time that can play with all the, the molecules of tracking in the dipole track. And as you'll see next time, of course, we can also then interrogate the molecules with microwaves for the head of the strand. So today I'm only going to show you the isotropic colors, but you can measure that very easily. Um, and, and we use this uh, quite standard technique of parametric keeping. So you modulate the track. Um, and, and when you hit uh, twice the, the track frequency, um, you boil it everything out of the track. And why is this a nice measurement? This is nice because you can put rubidium in the track, same track, and you can put cesium in the same track. And we know the polarizability of these two. And then you put the molecules in the track and you measure these loss resonances in exactly the same way. And then you can back out the polarizability of the molecule just by the ratio of the frequencies uh, and the known. Polarizability of the, the masses of, of the atoms. So, so this is an intensity independent measurement. And when we do this, we get uh, polarizability, this number, and the theory that you really had was just a flag model. Okay, so we agree very nicely 
with the isotropic probability. So we understand that how to track the model during the ground state, we know what it's doing. Um, so let's uh, let's look at some conditions for the, the density that we might track now. So <clears throat> we've already heard quite a bit about collisions. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more. Of course, um, I come from still think of myself as an atomic physicist. Uh, and in the field of multiple collapses, we know that uh, collisions are profoundly important. Uh, I mean, they're the basis of adaptive cooling and production of PECs and general thermal gases. We also know that um, they can lead to interesting results. Okay, so this is uh, ethymol physics, a three body ethymol physics that happened was uh, observed first in Innsbruck with cesium. Um, and, and as I've shown you, we, we learned how to control the collision with flashback resonances. Uh, and hopefully, I convinced you last time that we have this beautiful understanding of uh, two body atomic collisions and the associated flashback resonance with the ground state. As we've already seen, um, molecular collisions are richer, more complicated, um, and they're not so well understood, the atomic collisions, but they're, they're just as important. Uh, I think this is something as a field that we have to have to get the grips with and really try and understand. Uh, and I've encouraged the problem with Gina last time, but he's going to solve the problem by, by rewriting these algorithms that do this complicated. So, um, and, and I explained that uh, you know, last time this idea of an atomic flashback resonance, uh, and I showed you this, this is the flashback spectrum of cesium. I'm showing it again um, to emphasize two things, right? Uh, firstly, that although it looks complicated, in practice, it's actually relatively sparse, but the resonance of the, the well-defined fields quite well separated. And, and as I also showed you, or tried to convince you, it, it's also completely understood in terms of two body physics. Right? We understand where these resonances come from, the band state spectrum, and try to navigate the band in that. Right? So, molecular scattering is, is also going to be, these resonances are going to be important. Um, so, the first thing to grasp is that. Uh, you know, we we happily draw these simple potentials for uh, for an atom because it is a one B problem. Right? So for the even for a diatomic molecule, you have to start thinking that it is providing a much more complicated surface. Right? It matters whether my rubidium cesium molecule comes in rubidium first or cesium first to meet the rubidium cesium molecule. And that makes a difference. Um, and uh, I mean. John is one of the experts here on this. Um, and when we have this collision, we have this four body complex, uh, and the wells associated with that four body complex, so there's two molecules now together, they can be relatively deep. And what that means is there's the potential for very many um, states close to the threshold. Right? There's a high density of states. And of course, we've also got vibration and rotation of the groups of freedom. In the atomic case, last time I said that we come in on one hyperfine manifold, and then there's another one and another one. So that's it. Here we can have all of the rotational and uh, vibrational degrees of freedom of the molecule make more and more channels. So this means that the scattering is going to be highly resonant. Rather than having these sparse special resonances, we can have many resonances. Uh, and this is taken from a paper from John's group. Um, uh, and, and so this is, I think, a kind of estimated calculation of the rubidium cesium elastic cross section as a function of collision energy. And the point I want to emphasize is just okay, it's resonance. These are not sparse resonances, and it's a highly resonant scattering uh, And you're probably aware, and, and others have talked about this, this leads to the idea of uh, um, Sticky collisions. I think probably John was the first to form this, but although I did learn that uh, there was other theory for that. Oh, no, I think that can be Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, 
And, and um, you can treat this uh, and associate a lifetime uh, with this collision complex, um, which is related to the density of states and this collision pressure. Uh, in, in a simple, well, not simple, but in a, <laughs> this model. And I'm going to uh, steal what John, this this stuck in my memory. So John, I, I don't remember when this did. I remember it was in Santa Barbara some years ago. He explained the concept of this, uh, of these sticky collisions. And, and the idea is there's a, there's a bottle uh, and um, some insect of what, thank you, choice, um, flies into the bottle. Uh, and this is, of course, every physicist's represent representation of a, um, an insect. Uh, and that goes into the bottle uh, and kind of bounces around. Uh, and eventually it will come out. Okay. But you see, it, it has to send some time inside the bottle uh, before it can find its way back out. Uh, and that was the picture that John presented of this collision complex. The two molecules come together and they kind of get lost in, inside this bottle with this high density of states. But eventually, nothing happens. They can come like that and get my molecule back. If nothing happens, of course, something may happen, right? While, while the insect is stuck in the bottle, something can come along that's actually important. While the molecules are stuck in this complex, something can happen to destroy that complex. So, what can happen? Well, um, so one thing that can happen is chemistry. Right. Um, and actually, uh, and, and this is effectively there might be another way out of the bottle, right? right. Uh, and so, so this is uh, sort of allowed in the case of KRB. Okay, so KRB can actually uh, form this collision complex, but then it can come out as K2 and RB2. Right? And these these collision complexes are very important in the pathway for these, these chemical reactions, right? Uh, and this is uh, some, I mean, it was first seen, I guess, in the, the Jiller experiments on KRB, but then uh, Karen Cohen, and I hope you will talk about this, has done some beautiful experiments on hardware to actually can see these uh, these complexes and see these uh, reaction products that form this way. Okay. But not all um, biathylene molecules are reactive. Um, and so this is a table highlighting those that are, are, are non reactive. Um, and you'll see that rubidium cesium sits on here. And, and all this is is energetics, right? This, whether the RB2 and the cesium 2 are higher or lower. And I'd like to say, I'd like to say I was smart and chose this, but, but you'll notice the date in this paper is 2010, which is a few years after the first ground state molecule before. Uh, and maybe John knows this before. Did you know about this <laughs> when KRB molecules were first made? No, I, I think this is a surprise. Um, but actually, uh, um, some molecules would be reacting like this. Um, and all that means in the case of rubidium cesium is that these, these channels to form RB2 cesium 2 or RB2 CS cesium, um, they all sit higher in energy. Okay, so if I come in and I can form this complex, this is my insect stuck in the bottle, um, I, I can't access these channels. Uh, and so all that should happen is I should come back out. There's no reactive pathway. And in the case of rubidium cesium. So you do the experiment, <laughs> and this is what you see. Okay. Um, you form the molecules in the trap, and they go away. And it's not just rubidium cesium. You can look at some of the other non-reactive molecules on here. Uh, this is another rubidium cesium plant with um, sodium potassium, sodium rubidium. They also show more or less the same. Right. Um, we get this this long process, even though these are not active. <laughs> so, what's the mechanism for the observed cost? So that, that's the question. So, so if the molecules stuck together long enough in this complex, then it is possible that another molecule could come along and it kind of get an enhanced free body position. That really requires quite a long lifetime for the complex, right? Because the, the 
the molecules are moving around in the sky relatively slowly. And so to get that to happen requires a really quite long life now. Um, so more recent calculations show that for rubidium season, the complex lifetime is probably about a quarter of it. So it's, it's quite long, but it's not long enough for, for another molecule to come along that line, right? And this is work from uh, Thais Farman and co-workers. And, and what they also showed, though, is that there can be another process. And that process is optical excitation. Where does the light come from? Well, the track. Right? Because the, the molecules are sacked at quite an intense beam, which is the track. Um, and they calculated um, sort of laser excitation rates for these complexes. This is for NAK complexes. Um, but what you see, these are common trapping wavelengths, and the rates are just enormous. Okay. Oh, and more to the point, um, they're enormous for any wavelength. Okay. The complex is so complex that there are so many transitions that wherever you sit your data, unless you prepare to get CO2 wavelengths, um, you can entire try to spare on the last tension very quickly. Um, so the key though is um. Complex formation could well be the rate that it's expanding. These processes are fast. What's debating the loss is, is how fast the complex is formed. Okay. So we can analyze the, the loss that we, we took, okay, and, and we fit this with a allowing a, a power law in the density, and sure enough, it looks like a two body process. In fact, we can show that by putting on one body decay or three body decay. Um, and, and really, I think it looks two body in character. So, so, this is really a process that involves two molecules. Uh, and we can play a little bit with the density. It's quite hard for some molecule number is low, but, um, but we can also track that down to metals that correlates between these two molecules. So, this supports the idea that um, the loss is proceeding by this complex, the two body complex form. So I'm going to apologize to you. So I'm going to uh, introduce the Y parameter that we call the simple parameterization of the loss. So, so to really get some <laughs> so to get some insight into this. So, so uh, as we've learned, I mean really doing these state of the art couple couple channel calculations, particularly on a particle like Rubidium season, is just at the moment. Not, not going to happen. It's a non-start. So, so these are the, the picture that, that I think has been spoken about already. Um, so what we do is we've got this collision. This incoming molecule is going to collide on some kind of potential. Uh, and what we basically do is say, well, is this long-range part? And we've already heard that's well characterized in terms of a, a C6. And you can use this quantum defect theory to calculate the, the quantum reflection that you get from, from this long range model. Okay. And some of it's going to be transmitted to this short range bit where all the, the complicated chemistry is going to go. Um, and that's where we do this horrible um, simplification and just say, okay, well, there's going to be some loss in here if we parameterize with this Y, um, but it might not be 100%. Uh, and so it's going to be some reflection as well, and there might be a phase shift associated with that. So we get that, we have another parameter for phase shift. So this uh, this bit that's transmitted to short range can come back with a less amplitude, um, be transmitted again, back out to, to interfere. And of course, there could be a secondary reflection here and principal things can bounce back and forth within this, this potential. And this bait has already been mentioned for Julian Mayer, which they have is. And, and what we've already talked about is universal. And what we mean is if, if y equals one, in which case everyone is lost at the short range, that's what we call this universal loss. So we can take that uh, model uh, for our temperature, or we say we, uh, Jeremy, Andrew Bright can take it, uh, and they can plot these nice Find pictures for us. Okay, so what's this showing? This is showing K2 as a function of this Y parameter and also this phase shift, um, which I think gives a, a nice picture of, of, of what could be happening. 
So out here we get this. Uh, this is the universal weight where y equals one. Um, but in here, this is where we're not getting complete loss of short range, so there's some reflection, and then that becomes phase dependent. And, and we can get interference. So some, some places the, the overall loss is lower, and some places the overall loss is higher than the universal. In which sometimes comes across as being contradictory, but um, it's not when you understand this interference system. And this is all basically dictated by um, the C sequence coefficient, uh, which we've already learned for a molecule like the video cesium is dominated by the rotational uh, splitting. Um, and, and that's why this C6 is looking more the So we can put our measurements on there, and it, it looks like, like this. Um, this one loss measurement we have, and already we know that. Um, it must be below y is 0.4, but of course we have no constraint on the phase, we can't constrain the two parameters with one, one measure. So what we do is more measurement. And we measure the loss of the function of the okay, And that, that's shown here. Uh, and then we can put on different curves associated with different y uh, and different um, phases. And all of these these particular curves here lie along uh, our our line. Okay. And in doing that, we can actually constrain uh, both y and the phase. This okay. I mean, we we sit there. Okay. So what have we learned from this? Well, actually, in the case of rubidium cesium, I don't think we really don't see this complete universal loss. Um, the, the probability of loss at short range is based at around, around 17% or so. Um, uh, and this deviation could be either that the complex destruction is incomplete or, or that the complex formation does not follow this, uh, this statistical model that we've been using. Here. But what we'd like to do is really understand a little bit more about the complex and this loss mechanism and um, whether it's laser based. We have this uh, idea from my song that it would be. Um, and we, but then we have an idea, actually, I say we uh, actually. So, this is a good story for people starting out. It goes to the evening and we talk to people. So, we were in uh, Cambridge, actually. Um, John Doyle organized a meeting and we were in a barbecue restaurant in the basement, lots of beer. Uh, and uh, one of your colleagues, Martin, um, we were talking about these losses and he said, Oh, it just switch the track on and It switched the track on and And so we went away and, uh, and did that experiment. And so that's what I'll tell you about. So what, what's that all about? So this is a, a very simple rate equation model of, of what we think is going on. Okay, so, so we've got a, a number of molecules. The rate is going to change the density of molecules. We've got this two-body process when two molecules collide. Uh, and that forms complexes. So this is the, the complex density. And the complexes have a lifetime. Uh, and if nothing happens, they, they will just decay back to the molecules. And of course, we get two here because two complexes, uh, two molecules make one complex. So that's, that's the factor two. But if we put on this light, um, then uh, we get another loss term on the complexes. And what uh, Tice has worked said, was that this rate is, is just enormous and it just saturates the loss. It's much longer than uh, one over the lifetime of the complex. So basically, any complexes that form are just instantly blown away by the line before they have a chance to go back to being molecules. Um, and so the molecule lifetime is going to look independent of intensity. Right? Because the first thing, the first experiment you do is think, well, let's just. Um, Turn down the track. So we don't see any of that because it's it's completely independent of the intensity because this rate is so high. And so the loss is set by the complex formation, which is exactly what we saw as two first. So what how does chopping a track help? Okay, so, so this is a diagram of what would happen if we chop the track. Um, as so we switch the track on and off. Uh, and when the trap is on, we've got this fast decay. But when the trap is off, if it's off, 
for long enough compared to the complex lifetime, then, then nothing's going to happen to the complex in, in that time. So form, and then go back out into the green world. So we turn off this loss mechanism. So we increase the trap intensity in order to maintain the same time average potential. But that doesn't change the loss because the, the loss is totally intense density factor. And then here, as I said, we can suppress the loss provided that the time spent in the dark is greater than this complex lifetime. Uh, and this is then plotting the, the decay curves for different ratios of this complex lifetime to the dark time. So obviously, if the complex lifetime is much longer than the dark time, then, then it, it doesn't work. And we just see decay much, much like the, the unmodulated trend. So if we extend this to longer times, then what we expect to see as a function of this ratio is different decay curves. Okay. So the experiment we do is we just sit at a particular time um, and measure the number of molecules as a function of the frequency of this chocolate. In fact, we do a, a slightly uh, different experiment because the chopping also heats the molecules a little bit and changes the, the density. We uh, actually make a comparative measurement where we're chopping and, and compare that to still chopping with adding a, a weaker CW beam. And the CW beam is, as I'll show you, it can just still fall at loss, but not strong enough to, mod to change the track in any way. I'm just saying. Okay, so, so we do this. So this is in the modulated trap. Measure the molecule number after a uh, couple of hundred milliseconds. It's a function of this modulation frequency. We do the same thing now with the CW light, the sweep CW beam on, and that's there to kill any complexes that form. And sure enough, we see a suppression. Uh, we see a difference in these two. We have to take lots of data. That's all that is. Uh, and if we do that, we can look at this, how much we're changing the loss. So this is modulated only compared to the modulated plus the CWB as a function of the frequency. Uh, and we get this, this difference that, that changes with the frequency. And we can fit that with this simple weight equation model. But the only uh, parameter in this is actually the complex lifetime. So K2, we've previously measured, we know that um, this guy is basically just infinite. So, so the only thing we've got to play with is this complex lifetime. And if we fit that, we get that half millisecond. Um, and, and I remind you the kind of prediction that ties made is a uh, uh, quarter of a millisecond. So, so this is amazing good, I thought, at this stage. Right? We can also characterize how dark is dark. You know, we can change the intensity of this weak um, B. That we're at it, and, and again, look at this difference that we observe between modulated and CW and modulated. And this is a logarithmic scale. And um, so, the point I want to emphasize here is this is this is the intensity we use for a typical 10 microkelvin deep trap. Okay? Uh, and it, it's huge on this. Uh, and so, we can't simply just turn down the intensity of the trap because we'd have to turn it down. By about four orders of magnitude, um, by which point there's no track. Okay. So, as I said, at this point, we were pretty happy. And people were pretty excited. Uh, and Karen Quinn did some measurements as well, and they, they kind of agreed. Um, we should start. Yeah, we should start. <laughs> but then everybody got excited, and other people started doing measurements, and oh, it didn't agree at all. All right, and I, I'm not going to talk through all of the other experiments that don't agree. I, we were so proud when we did the experiment again a year later, just to check, <laughs> and we still got the same number. Um, but there's this, uh, a, a very nice review has come out of the, the MPQ group uh, recently that kind of summarizes where things currently stand, both, uh, uh, both theory and experiment. I think. So, so if you're interested in this problem, I encourage you to. To look at it. So basically, in other systems, there's the uh, statistical model just gives us the right time to completely different all over the place. Molecules are very short, they're long, and it's all like problems. Okay, so this is the 
So I suppose what we're most interested in is can we avoid this this loss? Um, and, and there's lots of ideas actually. Uh, so you could do your experiment in a, a blue digit box, and that's just some of the experiments in the unit did that. Um, you could do a magnetic trap and ensure it would be nice if, when the laser cooled molecules, which are magnetically trappable, um, get to the density where collisions would become important. Uh, and uh, we'll see see what happens in those magnetic traps. Uh, and there's very interesting work in, in what that catalyst group with a triplet molecule, right, where they, they are able to do things in magnetic traps with a magnetic moment. There are proposals to shield the collisions, just to stop these collisions. And of course, I'm always reassured by the fact that you know, what we kind of set out to do in the first place is to pin the molecules in in optical lattices or tweezers, and then then for sure there are no uh, collisions. But you know, really, we'd rather understand these collisions and be able to use them just as we use them in, in the atomic chain. So let me try and end on a more positive note. Um, and, and just talk a little bit about the, these collisional shielding uh, ideas, and because there have been some great experiments, um, and I'll just briefly mention a couple. So this um, this is again from the Gillard Group ARB. I think John, you were proposed these ideas or the cool many, many years ago, even earlier than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the idea here is that uh, take two molecules in the rotationally the first rotation the excited state. So this is popping the energy two molecules now. And if you turn up the electric field, you can reach a point where you get this crossing with a molecule in the ground state and a molecule in the rotation, the second rotation excited state. And here at this crossing, you can get some dipole dipole coupling uh, and use that to engineer some present shielding. So if you sit on the right side of this, this sort of crossing. Then you can produce this barrier, okay. this repulsive barrier, which just stops the molecules from getting to short range and, and turns off these collisions. And, and that's shown here. This is, I guess, their loss rate. It's theta is due to a two body loss parameter. And you can see many orders of magnitude change in the loss rate uh, as they vary the electric field around these, these resonant conditions. <clears throat> so, this is wonderful work and much more positive. Actually, stop these collisions from happening and start using the molecules. And then, of course, there's the, these microwave shielding ideas. And, and this is also, as you've been wiped off, but this is also very much like these uh, um, dress state dipole dipole uh, pictures. So, so, basically, the idea is uh, when you have two molecules in the microwave field, you get a repulsive. Uh, Dress state and an attractive dress state. And if you go on the correct one, you can also engineer a repulsive barrier in a, a short range where the molecules come in by setting the parameters of this microwave field appropriately. And they've used that. Um, and actually, I should highlight the title microwave shielded uh, evaporation molecules to quantum heat energy. So this is a, a landmark, right? And also in Chile. And also the cool the thermionic KLB molecules to quantum genetics. So um, despite all these problems with collisions that we have, um, there are ways to overcome them and, and it's very exciting to have two experiments to actually produce quantum genetic gases and, and molecules, which I think are a period of importance, but it's been very, very hard to And those are just the images showing you. Okay, so I think I probably don't know how I'm doing to find out from the room, but I will. Uh, okay, then I will uh, I'll stop there and take any questions on, on this. Yeah, 
Yes, so we have put in mind more the measurements. Um, and uh, I didn't talk about it. Uh, so it's interesting because I think it's rubidium with rubidium is reactive. And uh, cesium with rubidium cesium is not reactive. Um, obviously, exactly the same. Also. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, the play a little bit here. Yeah, um, uh, I guess field, and don't see any difference with my like field. Uh, which we also tried to chop the graph. Um, that was basically inconclusive. Either the complex line by an pretty long, I'm pretty sure, or the laser rate is really low. But it, it was, we didn't, weren't able to conclude anything from the chop time. Okay. So, Uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was in that, that case, but, uh, but we have a new journal of physics paper on, on the atom molecule. And also the, a different type of time state of uh, rubidium cesium. So okay. that, was the, that was the one year later, <laughs> go and measure it again, and do some different type of time states. Um, yeah, so that, that was published in that. But uh, I mean, Jeremy is very keen to see the atom molecule, so but I have been to some people at the same time. Every time I measure, mention to the group, we measure some collisions, <laughs> they, they don't really want to do that. So, uh, what I would like is a really good. Um, I mean, the reason it's a bit soul destroying is because we don't really know what to look for. Yeah, so you could just scan the magnetic field and hope for this. If there was some effect, maybe an electric field would make a big change or something. Of course, all we see is loss. I think that's the sole destroying aspect. You get all this work to make molecules, and then every day you measure them go. <laughs> see the experimentalists. And... <laughs> what, can, can you see the dark? No. Yeah, we need more experiments like your questions. questions. Uh, in that uh, figure where you show the thing uh, compared to the chopping and chopping with the green wave, uh, well, yeah. Um, what is the sort of time taken to acquire each of those data points? Because the uh, error bar still seems to be uh, quite large. I think when one was studying for that, and this one. Yeah, uh, so so this is just a okay. So the the duty cycle of the experiment is about a minute. So we get one measurement, and um, I think on the on the left plot, I think it was maybe five measurements per per one. So this is just to give a kind of qualitative overview. So what we actually did was uh, um, to get this plot was. Um, uh, 50 measurements. So that's what's shown here. So we did 50 measurements chopped and 50 measurements chopped with the see that we can be more equally um, break out the statistics. So, you know, that's, so this is uh, two hours or so per point. And is there already input to conclude from every sort of data at the same? Uh... Uh, you mean, uh, so you mean over yeah, here? Over here. So this is. That I should have explained what's happening at this end that is um, with on the having the strand of the strand. Okay, because we're chopping the strand, we, we rely on forming a time average potential that the molecules proceed a time average. So if you if you chop too slowly, i.e., you get approach the trap frequencies, then um, then it's no longer looks like a nice time average potential for the molecule. And they actually get kicked um, by the chopping, uh, and that's why the, the molecule number plummets on this side. It just becomes a uh, it's basically just keeping molecules out of the trap by the quantity. Okay. So that's a limit of uh, the range over which you can explore. Is there a reason why it's let's say one and two both the, the blue and the red line go down? Here. Well, slightly 
let's say 0.5 or both? Uh, no, I wouldn't read too much into this. Um, I, I think the, I mean, the, the bigger, I mean, each one of these is then taken many, many measurements in order to get uh, to get this. Could just be that the time molecule number is not perfectly stable to start with. And so, yeah, if over the many hours of taking this measurement, it changes. Further questions? Thank you very much, Simon. We'll take a few minutes break. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Um, well, you said